it's as creative as an accountant's night out. Car Obsession is proudly supported by Exchange My Car, Carly and Draggy. For a limited time only, use Car Obsession 10 to get money off with Carly and there's also a discount code for Draggy as well, which again is Car Obsession 10. All of the details are in the video description below. The Mark IV Golf GTI. Let's be honest, it wasn't exactly Volkswagen's finest hour, was it? By then it was fat, heavy and it was a, a shadow of its former self. Thankfully, at the time though, there was a more attractive alternative, the Seat Leon Cupra R. The Golf GTI at the time was offered with a few different engine choices, some of which were better than others, but the Cupra R is refreshingly simpler, but more importantly, more powerful. The most powerful GTI had 180 horsepower, whereas this has 210, along with 270 newton meters of torque. This is thanks to the AMK engine code, which is a 1.8 litre four-cylinder petrol, which is aided by a K04 turbocharger. I like the Golf GTI, which had to make do with the K03 turbocharger, or in the case of the AUM engine code, the K03S. Zero to 62 is dealt with in 7.2 seconds, and the top speed is 147. So with this being an older car, you do need to wait a little bit more for the boost to kick in. There is a little bit of lag. Now I mentioned that this is the AMK engine code, but the facelift to this car offered the BAM engine, which is quite well known in the motoring world. And that offers 225 horsepower, along with, I believe it's 280 Newton meters. So of course it's got more power and more torque. That all hits 62 miles per hour in under seven seconds, and the top speed is improved to 150 miles per hour. But anyway, I haven't got that, I've got the AMK. So the, the performance is peppy. I wouldn't go so far to call it fast, but it's got enough performance to keep you happy. As you build up the revs, you do get a nice satisfying growl from the AMK, although you may hear it sounds as if I've got Darth Vader under the bonnet. That is thanks to a Ram Air induction kit. It does make a pleasing sound. It's not overly fast by today's blisteringly quick hot hatch standards, but as you can see, it's still able to paint a smile upon your face. Power is fed to the front wheels via a six-speed manual gearbox. And I have to say, the six-speed has got a nice change to it. The throws are maybe a bit long, but they've got a nice precise mechanical feeling to them. They've got a nice weight behind them. Now, speaking of weight, the pedals also have a nice weight to them. They've got substance behind them, particularly the clutch pedal, which if you're in stop-start traffic, it will feel like a calf workout. But I do like the firmness. It feels like a proper old school kind of car. The brakes are supplied by Brembo, and whilst they aren't the most bitey, they do offer enough stopping power, and there's a nice, again, a nice firmness through the brake pedal. Now, I'm going through some twisty bits. The handling, whilst it is tidy, is not the sharpest. The steering is hydraulic, so you get a nice natural feeling to it, and it's quite heavy, but it's also quite vague, a bit numb, a bit woolly. So you don't get... There's also some body roll to contend with as well. Now, interestingly, this is heavier compared to the Mark IV Golf GTI by about 100 kilos. Not quite sure how, because that's a large discrepancy. Surely the K04 Turbo can't weigh that much. But yes, this is a heavier car, and it doesn't exactly feel nimble in the corners. It is sure-footed in the corners, but if you're looking for a handling machine, then you may want to look elsewhere. 
Now, whilst the Leon Cooper are losers out to the Golf GTR on weight, bizarrely, I have to say, this is such a better looking car. I love the way how this car is proportioned. It's boxy, it's muscular, and above all, it's purposeful. But at the same time, it's quite subtle in its approach, as you would expect from a sat nail. Doesn't exactly scream on a hot hatch, but as standard, you have 18 inch alloys finished in a gunmetal grey. They look fantastic. They really contrast the ebony black paintwork really well. Now, in regard to features, what did you get with this car when it was brand new? Now, this car is around 20 years old, so you don't get any infotainments or driving modes. Everything is all quite straightforward and simplistic. The interior is also simplistic. It's, um, yeah, it's just loads of black plastic. It's as, um, it's as creative as an accountant's night out. It's not going to be a wild one, is it? But to be fair, when you're going down your favourite B road at a fair lick of speed, that isn't really going to be your concern, is it? I like the speedos. They've got a very classic feeling to them. White styles with red backlighting. It's just a very simple but just effective touch. But yes, in regard to standard features, well, this won't take very long. So I have a six CD changer. I've got climate control. I don't have cruise control, sadly. I've got front and rear electric windows. Um, bear with me. Um, oh, traction control, very important. Um, remote central locking. Yeah, that's about your lot, really. There's not much in the way of features, but don't forget, this car is, yes, almost two decades old. With this being a hot hatchback, it makes sense to speak about practicality. The boot is competitive, although it isn't the largest. It offers 340 litres, which is more compared to the Mark IV Golf GTI, but less compared to the first generation Skoda Octavia VRS. One thing to bear in mind is that although the boot is a fair size, there is quite a large load lip into it, so loading bigger, heavier items may be a little bit of a faff. In the back of the Mark I, if you are a taller person like me, I'm six foot two, you may struggle with it a little bit because there isn't a great deal of it back here. The driver's seat has of course been set for my height, as I mentioned, I'm six foot two, and as you can hopefully see, because it is quite dark in here, I haven't got much in the way of knee room, although leg room isn't too bad, so no real complaints there. Headroom is quite tight though. If you can hear creaking, that's the car, not me, I promise. I'm getting on, but I'm not quite that old. So yeah, if you are a taller person, then you may want to shotgun the front passenger seat. Now in regards to practicality, there isn't much of it back here. I do have a map pocket in the back of the front passenger seat, but curiously, not one in the back of the driver's seat, but never mind. I've got no door bins. I do have a hook either side, so I can hang something up. No center armrest, which means that no cup holders. Um, but I do get, I've got an ashtray. Yes, you can tell this car is of a certain generation, can't you? An ashtray, wow, that takes me back. Step into the front of the Mark I Cooper R and you are greeted by these very nice front sport seats, which look fantastic. They are comfortable, but they do lack a bit of support. I would like the bolstering to be a bit chunkier and a bit more supportive. Now, at the time this car was produced, you could have the optional Vicaros, which nowadays are very hard to come by. Anyway, let me park my bottom in this sport seat. Now, the other thing you are greeted by when you step inside the Mark I Cooper R is a sea of black plastics. It's clear to see this is not where Sayat spent its money, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because it means they've, they've spent the money on the oily bits. But yes, the interior is not exactly luxurious. There isn't much to it though, and it has stood the test of time rather well. Okay, the sliders on the air vents have worn, worn away a little bit, but not excessively. Everything, it still feels pretty sturdy in all honesty. Now, although this is, a, is, although this is an older car, there is still a few amount of features in here. So I've got climate control, believe it or not, which is working. So on a day like today, that is uh, very advantageous because it is boiling in the UK. I've got front and rear electric windows with a one-touch function, which is very handy. 
Uh, I would have had a CD player, but this has been superseded by an aftermarket unit. Actually, I've got a six CD changer, which is very fancy, but Sayat, in its wisdom, thought, no, we won't put it in the boot like pretty much every other manufacturer. We will put it in the glove box instead, where it dominates the space. So the glove box you're left with is minuscule. It's not a glove box, it's a glove pocket. It's pretty pathetic. Now that leads me quite nicely onto the practicality. Now the back isn't exactly good for it and the front isn't much better. I do have door bins, but they aren't overly big, but I do have a few smaller items in them. I've got a cubby hole down here, just in front of the gear lever. Another one here, just press a button and you have a little bit of storage as well as a cigarette lighter. Again, retro. Let's close that up like so and close that and close the glove pocket. I do have a little cubby hole to the right hand side of my right knee so you can pop some small items out of sight for some security. Two little slots here and yes that glove box which I mentioned which is pitiful. Now you do have a little shelf underneath the glove box but it's quite shallow and I can't really think of what you could put there and maybe one or two parking tickets, I don't know, it does seem to be a little bit silly. Now getting a good comfortable driving setup is a doddle because the steering wheel, even though this is an older car, it does adjust for rake and reach like so. And my driver's seat also has got a good level of adjustment, but of course it is all manual, no electrics involved. But to be fair, that's one less thing to go wrong. So yeah, the interior of the Mark One isn't going to win any awards, but to be fair, when you're blasting down a B road, that's unlikely to be a concern to you. Speaking of which, Now, when it comes to ride, it's not too bad. It is firm, but it's a hot hatch. It's more compliant than I would have expected. Now, could you daily this car? I think you could. The seats are comfortable, but as I may have already mentioned, I would like a bit more support, because through the corners, I just feel myself falling out, the, falling out of them a little bit. Now, I'm sure this kind of area isn't gonna to be too important to you, but refinement. What's that like? Well, it's a hot hatch. It's not gonna be the most quietest, although using a sound meter, from memory, this registered around 71, 72 decibels, which in the grand scheme of things, isn't that bad. And that was that 70 miles per hour. Visibility, again, talk about more boring things. The door mirrors are quite small, but they do their job just fine. Now, a word of warning, the rear visibility in the Mark I and Cooper R isn't overly fantastic, particularly when you're reversing. The rear window is quite raked and quite slanted. And it means that sometimes when you're reversing, particularly if you're approaching a wall or another car, yeah, there is a bit of guesswork that is involved. Time to conclude. Yes, by today's standards, the Mark I Land Cooper R isn't the fastest and compared to other cars at the time, it may not be the most dynamic in the corners either. However, I think it looks awesome, it has good tuning potential and a decent value on the used car market as well. Mind you, I think you would be hard pressed to get one for the price I paid for this, which was just £250. What a bargain. Thank you for watching this video, I do hope you have enjoyed it. If so, be sure to like, comment and subscribe. If you are subscribed, don't forget to click the bell icon so you get notified every time I make a video. But until the next time guys, be sure to keep up the car obsession.